You ever miss out on a really cool guitar or a deal that just haunts you for the rest of eternity? Here's the story of this one. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Now, to be fair here, I had absolutely no way to get this thing because it was down in Florida, but a viewer of the show sent me this beautiful Gibson Les Paul, simply listed as Gibson Guitar for 600 bucks. Take a look at this thing. Oh, oh my. This encapsulates everything I love about the Norland era, from common modifications to construction methods that were deemed questionable and hated by purists, to just having so many cool specs to this. Let's go ahead and piece this thing together to figure out what on earth even is this. So first off, 600 bucks. I don't care about any of these modifications that we're talking about. Look at this top. It is absolutely stunning. So much flame wood grain pattern going on. It's the ultra active kind, I can just tell. So when you hold this thing up to the sunlight, it's going to dance around. But get this, we got one, two, three, four, five pieces, at least five. There might be seventh piece hidden within here. It's kind of hard to tell if these edges are all just one or two. I think so far the most multi-piece top I've seen on a legit Gibson is seven pieces. But this one is just so fantastic in the fact that it has all the wood grain. Most times Norland era Les Paul standards, they look like this. Just in case you don't know, Norland era. Generally accepted as 1969-ish through 1985. But to further refine that, standards didn't really exist again until about 1975-ish, into 1976. Before then, you can find custom orders where somebody said, hey, Gibson, you want to put humbuckers in this Les Paul Deluxe? That reigned supreme at that time. But anyways, here's what the tops would look like. They'd be multi-piece. Usually, they'll be three pieces. You've got some wood grain, like this is a particularly nice example. Other times, they'll just be kind of plain. I mean, this one's not too bad either, but you get the idea. It's not the two-piece center seam ultra flame top. I'm not saying that those didn't exist, but that was definitely not the norm. Pretty much until you get into the prehistoric era in the early 80s. So anyways, this thing is just fantastic because of that and the fact that it has the natural finish and you can actually see it. And that's just one of the things that tells you right away this was likely a Norland era Les Paul to begin with. Because if you look up here, I mean, are we sure it's even a Les Paul? Is it a Gibson product? Yeah, I'm pretty darn sure. I mean, you've got your normal cutaway here, but then somebody has added another offset comfort carve right there. I I have no idea, but they did it. They did it. Not quite as extreme as this 50s Les Paul that I've documented. It's still for sale if you're interested of an actual double, double cut 1954 Les Paul. But double cuts, I mean, it was a semi-what common modification. A lot of times people like to do the access heel carve, as we call it today. But that ties into like a cool 70s, 80s thing to do. But then right here, you've got a DiMarzio double cream pickup. However, this up here actually just looks like a regular double cream. Did this start life as a Les Paul KM? You can learn about those in this episode. I've got a natural one, but eh, that'd probably be a no for me because, hey, we've got the Nashville style bridge here that's not the two-piece maple top. But we'll dive in a little bit more on that here later. But then we've got a random fender knob on here, whereas the other ones are error correct. So just by looking at this photo alone, from what I can see here is this is likely like 1973 to 1975-ish, made in Kalamazoo, Les Paul Deluxe. So that means it originally looked like this. Here's a particularly nice one that has some awesome figuring within it as well. Maybe not as crazy as the example we're looking at today, but it's got the three pieces. But we would have this mini humbuckers. So somebody has taken the router, not only to right here, but also to our pickups, but that was ultra common. You always got to be careful when you're buying a standard from this era, because a lot of times they're just a routed deluxe. But it looks like we've got a rosewood fretboard with beautifully aged acrylic inlays. But now let's move on to our second photo angle. Okay, we can see a little bit more with our fretboard here. It looks like it might have been professionally refretted. Those are pretty tall looking frets, and I can't quite see the fret nibs, but maybe you guys can when we zoom in during editing. But here we go, confirmation that it's definitely an early 70s deluxe, at the very least, because of the truss rod cover style. They just have a certain look to them. And of course, the Norland era logo here. Somebody's definitely replaced our tuners with some Grovers, though, because these normally came with Klusen style tuners that are the push-in style, rather than the secure on the top style. 
but right here we can actually see this does indeed have the pancake body construction. For some reason, people on the internet hate pancake bodies, but I've never had an issue with those personally. Apparently, mahogany was getting scarce during these years, so it was actually a little bit more costly of a process for them to laminate maple in between it, but it made it so they could still make the full mahogany backs. If you really don't want a pancake body, avoid 1969 through about 1976. You can see them as late as 78, but generally 76 is when that starts to get phased out. But take another close look here. It looks like we have wide binding in the cutaway. So that tells us a little bit about its date of production. But look at this. We have binding right here, but that's the area that got hacked away. So this probably didn't start life as a natural finish because somebody at least spliced on a little bit of an additional piece of binding or they just rebound the entire thing. I don't know, looking at it from here, it looks like that's probably just a splice job. Maybe it's not as clean as it looks, but at the very least, the sides and back probably had to been refinished, but sadly, not a single photo of that. So, whoever bought this, please contact me because I'm curious, is there any other weird stuff going on back here? I mean, check out the hornless SG for crying out loud. If you just saw the, uh, an SG with its horns cut off, that was only half the story of that one. I mean, look at the back here in this special Halloween episode. But it definitely has a, a non-original case. It's a little bit of a road dog, but it just encapsulates everything about the 70s. And that's why I love this thing. Whoever got that for 600 bucks, that's a steal. How much do I think this is worth today? I think a very, very, very conservative estimate, even with this crappy case, 1500 bucks. I'm sure you might even be able to find somebody willing to pay 2500 which might sound crazy, but just the way this thing looks, it's got a certain vibe to it, and there's a lot of player collectors out there who would love this piece. For example, this guitar that's always surfacing around the internet and meme forums. We can clearly tell it's a Norland era Les Paul custom. However, it's been like Pete Townsend with a whole bunch of additional switches going on here. And it has every single pickup pretty much available at that particular point in time. You've got the P90, you've got the single coil, you've got the mini humbucker, and you've got a 1972 Gibson humbucker. And then, yeah, they added some more controls here just for fun. <laughs> People still aren't sure if this is a Photoshop job or not, but it, it looks legit to me, and if I ever saw that guitar, I would have to buy it. But sadly, it looks like it's a lefty, because a lot of times when you see this thing show up, it's been reversed, but then the Gibson lettering is not right. So there was a lefty out there that needed to be so ultra versatile that he did all this. Because if we got four pickups, you technically have enough for a volume and tone for each of them, just a very clustered layout. And then perhaps instead of these being actual switches, like you select which pickup you want, they're like in and out of phase for the certain ones, or maybe it activates some sort of a strange boost back here. Who knows <laughs> what they had in this thing. But the 8BR1 bridge definitely puts us in the early 70s, somewhere between 1970 and 1975. But judging by that, you know, just in case that is original, I would probably further modify that to about 72 to 75. But another fantastic example of, you know, a strange modified guitar that I would love to own for my personal collection. Like, we've documented the Headless SG, the number one meme guitar of ever, which one day I hope I can get back, but no, we're talking about this. Oh man, I, I love it and hate it so much all at the same time. <laughs> so, this is a, a, a different kind of double cutaway, where they just cut away the entire body. So once again, this looks like it's a uh, early 70s Les Paul Deluxe. This time, have no fear, the mini humbucker routes have been left alone, but the rest of the body has been chopped off. It's become a boat paddle. Like, it's so doofy. I love it and I feel bad for it. And people have seen this thing all over the internet. But they moved their toggle switch from here to down here, and they've just kind of moved all their controls right there. There honestly cannot be that much room right there in order for them to put the wiring, but a uh, Apparently it worked. This one's always nicknamed the weight relief guitar. Norlin era guitars typically get made fun of for being a little bit heftier. They are heavy guitars, so they're not for guys with bad backs, which unfortunately are the people who mainly grew up with them and have nostalgic feelings over these instruments. So this is one way people got around it, because you gotta remember, these were not always super highly expensive prized instruments, very similar to the original bursts. It's really only within the past 10 years that people have been all gung-ho, hey, Norlin era is really cool, there's some great stuff. 
And I attribute that to people like Mike Slabowski for teaching people like me about them. And then I teach other people and other people are teaching other people. And then nostalgia also has come in, COVID, all that stuff. And then people have just gone crazy with the prices. Because before guitars were collectibles, I mean, people used these to make music. You couldn't talk about them on the internet or debate with people for a living, which is a strange job that I have, but hey, I'm not complaining, it's pretty good. But do you remember this 1953 gold top? It would be considered blasphemous today to modify a 50s vintage Les Paul, but here's one that had a couple of additional switches to put onto it, as well as a Bigsby. You can check out this video if you need to learn more about it. But then, hey, you guys remember Les Paul's number one? Gibson gave him this thing and he hacked it up, as he liked to do on many guitars, to make it better, to make it known to what it is today. We've got the Gibson mod collection doing weird things with explorers. I mean, it's all exploratory. I get comments all the time saying, hey, why don't you actually just focus on playing your guitar? I just like documenting the histories of guitars and all the cool, weird, quirky specs. I'm not the best player out there. I don't claim to be. I can just appreciate them. So that's what I do for the guitar community, to help players and collectors alike find something that sparks inspiration. And that is 100% an important thing. And since we've got a little bit of time left today, let's hear some playing of strangely modified guitars of the past. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.